Okay, I think we can uh, start. Uh, good morning. Welcome in, uh, in Marseille. Okay, welcome in the Chip to Cloud uh, Security Forum. And again, thanks for coming uh, with us. Many thanks to our, our speakers uh, for this morning. So the session uh, will be organized in two parts. There will be a full keynote presentation this morning. Uh, followed by a panel debate uh, on a specific subject. I think the, the, um, the theme for this year is cloud security and virtualization. I think almost everyone uh, knows what it is. Uh, maybe even if the term virtualization is sometimes uh, more or less badly used or people don't exactly know what it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a very old concept. Basically, it's uh, hardware emulation by software. I am personally, I am Jean-Paul Thomason, sorry, I did not introduce myself. I used to be in the semiconductor industry for years, basically in the hardware. So when we understand we can emulate by software the hardware, we say, wow, that's horrible, we're going to close our plants, <laughs> manufacturing plants. In fact, not, because the more software you put, the more hardware you need very often. And also in the hardware industry, we use virtualization at least to emulate our chips before uh, making them. So I'm not going to be too long. Uh, simply, we will be pleased to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Jörg Borchert, sitting close to me. Uh, Jörg is the uh, chairman of the Trusted Computing Group. Uh, but he is also uh, executive vice president of Infineon, well-known company in semiconductor industry as well, especially in the security uh, chip, but not only. Uh, and uh, he is in charge of North America, right? Okay. Correct. <laughs> okay. So I know York for years, of course. Uh, so please, York, that's your turn. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Yeah, um, great to come here. Um, and I was happy that I made it because there were some challenges with travel from California here to Marseille, but uh, it was doable. And I wanted to start uh, with a few words uh, regarding the Trusted Computing Group. We are a non-for-profit organization and um, we are standardizing trusted computing technologies and basically, um, which is uh, supportive of hardware root of trust uh, for interoperability and uh, for worldwide adoption. We have around about 100 members worldwide and uh, with representatives on one hand from um, companies, and, uh, from enterprises, from academia, from experts, as well as uh, with government liaisons. And uh, with this one, I wanted to start and give you an overview and a um, kickoff for um, the day, and basically give you an overview where TCG sees at the moment uh, where we are, and what work items do we still have to do to make um, the cloud uh, more secure. So let me start with uh, some fundamentals. And Jean-Paul already uh, mentioned uh, virtualization. Virtualization is, is a very important concept uh, for cloud computing. And TCG sees the approach to uh, cloud computing uh, from a consumer perspective. So we're not coming from uh, the enterprise perspective, we're looking from a consumer perspective. And what does the consumer or user want to do? Basically, he wants to store um, data and applications, backup data, allow collaboration, and replace this data center. And what kind of devices are interacting uh, basically with the cloud? On one hand is the old PC, the PC client. We have mobile platforms. We have in the future embedded devices 
Internet of Things, think about, virtualized servers, and then also uh, extensive networking. And all these components play a role in this kind of standard. In total, there are eight components, you will see it. I will not touch everything. I will only go into a little bit more detail of four components. So, how is cloud different? And um, it is that um, the user normally does not own the cloud infrastructure. And um, that means the user is normally not in control of the data. And the recent events which seem to have, uh, especially in, in US, course, major hiccups, it's uh, this time Apple with the iCloud. It shows that uh, we easily click on the so-called SLAs, we no, uh, the uh, license agreement, uh, and we normally don't read all the details. And that's basically the legal foundation, how you interact with cloud and uh, cloud computing. So you agree basically to the terms and uh, the terms and conditions and uh, basically uh, today's SLAs are pretty uh, much in favor of uh, cloud providers. So what are these eight components? And this is where we try to establish standardization. It starts with the clients it has to go with servers, with the networks. Then we need standardized policies and credentials, standards and reference models, trusted applications, cloud trust management authority, and storage. And I can only address some of them. These are the eight components I mentioned. And I only will address right now four of them where the TCG is trying to put standards into place. So, um, what is the major um, topic at hand? We need trusted components for so-called multi-tenant infrastructure. And this TMI is the major thrust of our uh, initiative. And that means you have uh, three major components here. You establish a level of trust between parties, then exchange information with parties within the bounds of a trusted relationship, and last but not least, you enforce a policy using integrity management and measurements, assertions and attestations which are exchanged between the different parties. And that means you have to identify executable policy statements and information sources, things, decision authorities, execution points, and policy hierarchies. And this is not trivial in, in the standardization side, uh, and I will go into this topic a little bit in more detail. So where does it start? It starts with virtualized platform. It's the base for the secure multi-tenancy. And you see there on the bottom, on one hand, uh, the physical TPM. But as soon as you go up in the server, you are immediately into virtualized TPMs. And these are the software TPMs you talked about. But all the servers on the bottom have in the concept and in the standards we are providing as a hardware root of trust, a, v uh, a physical TPM as this root of trust. Above that, you have the virtual machine and then different operating systems can run on top of these uh, virtual machines and it can be uh, guest OSs, Linux based, Windows based. Here you have a plethora of uh, uh, options which we have to foresee in the standards regarding migratability of virtual machines. From that, 
you add now the component cloud. And that means you need between different cloud providers basically a migration authority to establish trust and to measure trust. And this is the next dimension. Um, the next component is our TMI reference model, which I wanted to share with you. And this is basically um, based on the consumer and assumes that a user has local data in the cloud and that the cloud will allow to migrate data when a user is, for example, traveling around the world and has his mobile data basically going from one enterprise provider to which where he has his um, data stored locally, provides it to the enterprise provider, and when he travels and wants to have his data with him in other regions, we have then, or on mobile devices instead of a um, PC client, he has then a cloud service provider. And here you can see that you have to take into consideration migrations between storage on the enterprise side and the uh, cloud service provider, as well as on the user device, so that you have multi-access between, on one hand, uh, a user device, a PC client, for example, and a mobile device. And this is the fundamental reference model which we have in mind. So basically, as I already mentioned, from a consumer side uh, to cover this uh, uh, use case. So when it comes to authentication and authorization and wedding in a trusted cloud, there are fundamental five questions. Who are you? What are you? And what TCG has not done so far and where we have to put now emphasis on is where are you? The topic is that we have to put tags on data because the recent events over the last year had put up the topic of where data can be hold and that means you have to um, combine uh, location data with uh, the data which you store in the cloud is uh, certain um, requirements in certain areas need that the data is not migratable. Today, a cloud service provider optimize normally their load on a worldwide basis and this means that data is moved, for example, from the United States to uh, Europe, vice versa. These kind of things uh, are getting more um, challenges uh, under uh, the aspect of uh, trust and uh, that means that uh, data and location is getting uh, linked together. That means that you can pro uh, do uh, with a uh, <coughs> hardware TPM attestation about the location and combine that with the data where it's stored and that it cannot migrate to other locations. So um, then the next one is, can I trust you? That means the attestation has to build uh, to, uh, into the environment. And uh, this is um, an interesting part. And then uh, what are you authorized to do? What kind of uh, uh, changes are you allowed to do as a user? And um, here that creates a framework for uh, evaluation and what can you do as a user can basically um, is a trust matrix. And uh, the trust matrix and harm you can do in, in, the, in the cloud uh, can be measured 
um, and it's one of the models we try to standardize by uh, six areas against harm. And it's measured by potential impact, and that means um, the first one is just inconvenience. The second one it means that we are already causing through impacts financial losses. The third one from a severity is reputation loss. Then the next one is uh, unauthorized releases of data. And then last but not least impact on personal safety and the highest one would be even civil or criminal violations. And uh, these um, kind of trust matrix is something which we have to take into consideration when uh, we standardize things and when we are migrating um, between different uh, cloud service providers. Here, major standardization is in works, but is still at the uh, beginning of uh, overall uh, standards within our framework. Then last but not least, on the standard side, uh, we have also things to do on the uh, server side. And here, it's work in progress. Uh, the first part, the virtualized platform, is more or less done. What we have to do is uh, still to uh, provide uh, on the open source side adoption that uh, certain uh, software has to be developed. It's basically virtual uh, TPM, open source software, and then uh, create a community around it. Uh, we have um, virtualized TPMs from certain vendors, but for adoption purposes, um, open source uh, virtual TPMs uh, would be um, is our, our goal to, to do. And then last but not least here on this one, this trusted migration authorities is an open topic. Um, these trust matrix is the first step in the direction of um, standardizing them. But we did, uh, um, discovered that as a major work item. So, um, these authority uh, requirements um, can be addressed uh, by this migration authorities. These migration authorities, and this is the, the general framework where we have to then go deeper, it guarantees that the target platform can be trusted before the migration happens. It guarantees that TPM rules are not violated and it guarantees that content confidentiality is ensured. So you have to have, when you migrate from one trusted site into the next site, you have to compare first these values and make sure that the new cloud uh, can be trusted. And this means multi-tenancy and multi-tenancy migration. And this is the hard part here of the, my, uh, of the standardization which we have in front of us for the next years. I gave a cloud overview in 2012, so we made progress. We introduced the TPM 2.0 with new um, um, hardware features, especially with uh, updated cryptography. So that has been released. We have certain reference models. We have uh, already um, the um, rollout of um, some platforms from an enterprise side, but here this topic is the hard part in the standardization. And that means we have to work together. So there are other standards organizations which play an important role in this overall effort. It's the Cloud Security Alliance, it's ENISA, it's FedRAMP, NIST is involved, ISO, ITU, and then a DMTF. And on the open uh, uh, software side, I don't want uh, to miss here OpenStack, but I couldn't put this on the, uh, on the picture. So we have here 
a lot of stakeholders uh, in this uh, topic of um, standardization in trusted cloud environment. So I basically addressed only these, these four circles. One important um, mentioning is storage. Uh, the TCG has been quite successful to establish uh, self-encrypting drives. Self-encrypting drives today with, uh, are becoming servers by itself. And uh, obviously, um, encryption of data is a major cornerstone of a trusted cloud. And the self-encrypting drive, from that perspective, has been proven as, as very resilient and is being offered from a large number of uh, commercial enterprises already today. I would say, on that side, mission really already accomplished. The other ones are uh, work in progress. So, in summary, I wanted to say, TPMs and trusted computing are essential for the cloud. Uh, the TPM is today an affordable mass market product. It's pervasive and from that perspective, a logical choice to be the hardware root of trust. The Trusted Computing Group does not and cannot solve the entire cloud uh, security problem. We need to work with ma major players, we need to reach out to the other standards organization, and we need a cohesive, complete solution. At the moment, these are kind of patchwork, and with that one, uh, it does not have to uh, be the field of dreams paradigm because we can dream our perfect architecture that does not work. We have here to work together to find solutions which can be sold, which can be adopted, and which are um, implementable. And therefore, um, we have to advertise the game as a group and then sell the tickets. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jörg. Uh, maybe we have time to pick up one or two questions from the room, if there are. No? Yes. One question. Uh, the rule between the physical TPM and the digital TPM is described this time, is that right? Because of course, when you are taking the scale of the TPM, the TPM, the TPM, the TPM, the Okay, uh, so you use the, um, uh, the logical, the, uh, excuse me, no, the physical TPM, you use as a hardware root of trust to provide attestation and uh, basically when you implement the virtual TPM, um, you build over that one a signature and check on these on a, on a constant basis that they are not getting compromised. And you have to do that, That's a, it's a very good uh, point, uh, you have to do that on a constant basis. In critical application, you have to do it almost at runtime. Because if you lose a virtual uh, TPM, um, you have a challenge. Okay probably more details on one-to-one. -one. Uh, also, I forgot to mention that there will be, during this uh, conference, two dedicated uh, sessions, one for NIST, still on the cloud, uh, and another one for uh, TCG as well. So you can meet uh, Jörg and some colleagues also later on if you want. Cool. So our next speaker is uh, Jovan Golic, okay. <coughs> Jovan is uh, the action uh, line leader for privacy and security and trust at the I EIT ICT lab in Italy, right?
morning to everyone. Uh, yeah, the objective of, of, of this talk, it's okay. The objective of this talk is to, to address uh, some basic uh, aspects of privacy, security, and trust uh, in the world of ICT, and in particular in relation to, to, to cloud computing uh, on one hand, and on the other in relation to the role of EIT ICT labs. Just a few words. EIT stands for uh, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, and the ICT labs of this institute is one of the first knowledge and innovation communities, it's so-called KIC, set up uh, a few years ago. Uh, this institute and the labs are initiative of the European Union, the European funded by European <coughs> Commission, and they are motivated by an urgent need to strengthen the ICT competence in Europe. So this is recognized. And the mission is to drive European leadership in ICT innovation for economic growth and quality of life. So both in terms of occupation, economy, and also quality of life. Through collocation centers, now there are seven of them. One of them is in Italy, in Trento. Then uh, through the network of partners, so it is not totally open, it works uh, in terms of partners. There are more one, uh, than 100 of them now. And a business development, uh, development accelerator. So there is a large network of business uh, developers. Uh, this mission is achieved by linking education, research, and business, but not general education. Uh, uh, it's by funding finaliza uh, uh, general research. It's by funding finalization stages of research, aiming at bringing to market uh, innovative ICT products and services uh, through one-year projects conducted by the partners and also the others by, by subcontracting. Um, so it's one year project, it's different from uh, traditional European projects because, uh, because the objective of these activities is directly uh, to develop products and, uh, and deploy, in fact, products and services. So it's on the top of the European framework uh, and Horizon 2020, for example, programs. There are eight uh, thematic action lines uh, in the I, uh, EIT ICT labs. One of them, for example, is related to future cloud and the other is related to privacy, security, and trust, and I manage that one. So let me first start with some basic uh, concepts. So you all know that data security has three components, three uh, dimensions, data integrity, confidentiality, and availability. So it is basically the two of them, the first two of them are achieved by using some crypto techniques. So you, for data integrity, uh, essentially add a tag for detecting unauthorized changes to data. For confidentiality, you apply a reversible transformation of data, so encryption. And data availability is a, a little bit different, so you need the redundant resources, uh, uh, dynamic testing for failures, uh, recovery, and, and so on. So it's very costly. In fact, data availability is, is a very important, maybe critical component of in the world of ICT no, uh, related to data security. But then there is also something that is uh, uh, intrinsically related to data integrity, but it is a bit different. So it is entity authentication and identification because it's not about the integrity of data, but about integrity, authenticity of entities. So entities in the real world. So you need to verify some attributes, uh, real world physical logical attributes. This is called identification, all sorts of attributes, including location and names and companies and roles and so on. Then you need to verify time of communication to, 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 to avoid re replay attacks. And th there are protocols for, for doing this. So there is also entity authentication and identification. And then uh, we should keep in mind that security, uh, when we speak about security, is always relative to attacks. So there are different types of attacks with different objectives, different impacts, uh, so say negative consequences, different scales like uh, creating damage, financial reputation, uh, identity theft, denial of service, also terrorism, cyber attacks, and so on. And security has a cost. Uh, all these measures ha have some cost, and uh, the hope is that widespread usage uh, reduces the cost and enables security by design. Because really, this is the, the main paradigm there if you want to 
achieve real security with respect, say, to sophisticated attackers, you need security by design. So uh, ideally, uh, we would uh, like to see security as a business opportunity rather than an obstacle. So in many uh, cases nowadays at present times it is considered as an obstacle because it's, it has additional costs and it's not simply to implement. You need ex experts to, to implement, to add security to your applications. Let's say a few words about digital trust. It's a very basic concept. We, we can talk for hours about that. So basically, it is a level of confidence that a product, that a product or a service or a process in digital world is functioning accordingly. So according to something, specifications, claims, whatever. And it is relative. Uh, it is conditional and it is time dependent. So it changes in time. So it's, it's a very complex uh, uh, concept. And it has basically a subjective component and an objective component. And this objective component can be called trustworthiness. There's a difference between trust and trustworthiness because uh, this uh, trustworthiness is anchored in, in some, uh, say, uh, assurance that, that is not only of subjective nature. nature. Uh, best practices and reputation are fundamental for, uh, for, for digital trust. They remain to be fundamental. But the problem here, uh, when we speak about digital products, is that uh, the, uh, these best practices and reputation are, are, not, are not enough because data security by itself is very complex, relative, conditional, diffic uh, difficult to verify. So best practice may mean nothing uh, in this. So you can have a uh, functionality, uh, perfect functionality measured also by, by reputation, but in practice the service provider can copy all the data and send, send somewhere. There is no way of, of controlling that. So it's very relative. The, uh, we, we should keep in mind uh, the fel uh, following basic relation on the scale to zero, uh, from zero to one, uh, uh, that trust plus distrust plus uncertainty equals one. So there are three components related uh, trust uh, is determined by, say, positive uh, experiences. Distrust by negative experiences. And uncertainty is determined by not knowing uh, the technology or, or whatever. So uh, uh, to increase trust, we can do it directly or by decreasing distrust or uncertainty. And this is, in fact, what is done in, should be done in, in practice. So the factors that help increase trust uh, are policies and agreements. This is what is uh, applied in the real world. The liability, so they should have some legal uh, weight. Then reputation, best practices. So this is an easy part. But then, uh, because this, this can, can be done, and uh, in fact, these policies and agreements are, are hardly uh, controlled by the, by the end user. So it, it, it is very difficult to, to do it really, uh, to, to uh, uh, increase trust by this way. But this is done. Uh, uh, in practice currently. We need assurance levels, all sorts of assurance levels. Not uh, these policies explained on, on three, four pages that nobody reads, but uh, really we, we should categorize the, the assurance levels. Like, for example, with respect to privacy, we could introduce privacy assurance levels as, as quality assurance levels. Then we need technical and technological assurance. So th there is lots of things to do uh, in that respect. We also need transparency, verifiability, auditing, cost-effective and practical certification, not like with common criteria, but something very practical and uh, not uh, as time-consuming uh, as it is now. Then we need information sharing. It is obliged by law uh, directly, in, in fact, so it, it affects distrust. If you have some incidents, you, you need to report. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, because it, if you report an incident, you reduce trust, but in the long term, uh, if all the service providers know that, uh, it helps increase trust, information sharing. There is awareness on the part of end users and knowledge that is related to uncertainty. Uh, then now let's uh, pass to some more uh, technical topics like software and hardware security. Software also includes virtualization security. So on, on the top, you, you've seen there, uh, when speaking of, of uh, data security. The basic techniques are cryptographic techniques. And for cryptographic techniques, for assurance is there, for, for trusting uh, for, uh, in these techniques. Uh, basically, you need standardized cryptographic algorithms and protocols. In many cases, this is, uh, they are used. And they are subject to, uh, to public scrutiny. And uh, therefore, they are trustworthy. So this is what we have in crypto. 
crypto is on the top of the security chain, crypto protocols and algorithms. And then in practice, we also have many industrial, we used to have many industrial solutions that, have, that they are proprietary, but it just happens that almost all of them turn out to be weak after being exposed. So standardization and openness is a good practice. But when we implement things in software, like these algorithms, and also when we speak about platforms like operating systems and so on, so software products, operating systems, middleware, applications, are frequently proprietary and obfuscated for various reasons. So trustworthiness with respect to data security is done, uh, then not well anchored. So we cannot trust uh, really objectively in software products because we don't verify whether they are secure or not. And in fact, uh, when we speak about cybersecurity, uh, these uh, software weaknesses are uh, one of the main sources of, of attacks in, in the cyberspace. So software and software updates uh, can be authenticated and certified by digital signatures, but then uh, they should be issued by trusted public keys or uh, by trusted entities. In this case, we need to associate uh, entities with keys. Uh, th that uh, binding should be trustworthy. So there is always trust there. Untrusted applications can be separated from the trusted ones, like on mobile devices by using trusted execution environment or virtualization. You also on secure encryption mobile phones, you use virtualization there, not only in, in, in the cloud. But the bottom line here related especially to, to applications, the security of applications, the detection of malicious applications and intrusions by signature based or anomaly based techniques in a centralized or distributed manner, possibly in set boxing environment, uh, is fundamental for data security, but the effectiveness uh, uh, needs to be improved. So they are not effective enough, all these techniques. Uh, they, they are very important for the end users. Uh, 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 with respect to virtualization security, uh, of course, uh, it is fundamental for cloud services. Uh, there, there is the issue of hypervisor, that software running on the host platform for generating and supporting guest virtual machines. And uh, the isolation of guest virtual machines is fundamental for virtualization security. Basically, we should separate the memory, the, the usage of memory. And then uh, proving the isolation and other properties of hypervisor, that's not done currently in practice uh, to a large extent, by formal security analysis, so by formal methods, is a challenge. So there are some attempts. We have some partners in the ICT labs working on this. Then you need to simplify hypervisors because it, it's very complex. It's, it's difficult to prove anything. Hypervisor can be, in fact, also transparent and open for verification or certified. This can significantly improve trustworthiness. Uh, then, assuming uh, uh, regarding the intrusion detection and monitoring, uh, uh, cloud computing really facilitates uh, uh, this, uh, this property. Assuming that the host platform is trusted, security of guest uh, virtual machines and distributed middleware so intrusion and anti-malware protection, including APTs or advanced persistent threats, can be efficiently controlled by the monitoring software process running on the host. So you, uh, this is more secure than, uh, than previous, uh, previously when individual users uh, run their individual software on their individual machines. Then you can also do virtual monitoring in IDS on the network level. So this is very positive uh, to cloud security. But then on the other hand, uh, is assuming that the host platform is a trusted, a good assumption, you need also to address the Snowden case shows, the inside the security. So you need traceable things like traceable system administrator interventions, integrity of logs and audit trails, possibly also to be recognized by forensic authorities. This is a bit dif difficult. Then strong authentication of, 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 of the uh, administrators and, and uh, privileged users. You, should, uh, you need shared access and control. And uh, so there are techniques for this. You need separation of duties. So the, uh, all this is needed also to build trust. Let's say a few words, uh, then we are going down from software now to hardware security. Uh, about hardware security, because it's, uh, it's, it's fairly basic. The cloud system can be secure on the software level, but insecure on the hardware level. So we need to control also hardware if you, if you want real security with respect to, say, sophisticated attackers. Strong hardware platforms and architectures, including self-checking circuits, are important, especially with respect to sophisticated attackers. You can introduce all sorts of hardware bugs there on the server, for example, 
and then make uh, make make the thing uh, the system totally insecure. So you need, but how to control that? Basically, you need, you need transparent and auditable hardware fabrication facilities, and but this is very difficult to, to implement in practice. So so th there are big problems there in terms of hardware security. Then we are speaking uh, uh, about hardware devices that are connected to the cloud, such as smart meters and various uh, various sensors especially if they provide the sensitive data to the cloud, like for smart homes and uh, electronic health uh, meters and so on, they need to be strongly authenticated uh, and identified by using cryptographic keys or chip templates. So that's an analog of biometric template called uh, PUF, uh, PUFs. So it's physical unclonable functions. Because for Internet of Things, we need to authenticate these devices. Uh, then such devices should better be run on open and standardized operating systems uh, guided by the simplicity and security principles. Like, uh, for example, now there is a project embedded SIM in GSMA, and then th th this is the problem, interoperability. The, the various uh, SIM vendors uh, uh, use their, their, their proprietary operating systems, so uh, then it, it's very difficult to, to build trust there. Then. Uh, uh, another important feature related to security is the generation of cryptographic keys and management. So storage and this sort of, uh, for, for example, you all know that you to store them in software, it's not so secure, so you need hardware security modules, so secure elements and, and so on. Then uh, I, I would just uh, like to point out another possibility it's related to, to strong authentication. We uh, uh, should use hardware security tokens for strong uh, user to token to cloud authentication. So we can also authenticate biometrically user to the token and then the token to the network by cryptographic keys. And we can put that on a USB key and have this instead of memorizing hundreds of and using weak, weak authentication in terms of passwords and memorizing hundreds of passwords, then you can use a simple token uh, secure in hardware, temper resistant to do this. Uh, and this is not done uh, in the current world. If you use single sign on like only one password, then it's very bad for, for, for privacy because you can link everything you do. Uh, uh, the entity who knows that password can link everything you do on the, inter on the internet uh, related to different s services. And then also there is another uh, issue uh, related to hardware or software implementations of cryptographic algorithms and protocols uh, that are run on sensitive data, they should be resistant to the implementations to side channel attacks. So that increases the cost, but uh, for, for, for many applications, that, uh, like banking and so, that uh, turns out to be uh, important. Then let's say a few words about the data privacy. So uh, we already touched data privacy. Uh, everybody has its own, uh, his own, uh, her own understanding of, of privacy. Let's try to, and uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are lots of fuzzy concepts uh, in this area, and then the, uh, this is part of the reason the situation, uh, to my mind, uh, with respect to privacy in the cyberspace is not very good now. So, in fact, we are losing the, the control of, of privacy, uh, to my mind. So, data privacy is about the security. So, it's the security of personal data. So, it's also integrity and confidentiality, not only uh, uh, confidentiality. So, of any sensitive data, not only personal data, like industrial secrets. So, uh, data regarding citizens, private or public companies, institutions, and organizations. But it's not only about the security. Sometimes, or in many cases, you cannot uh, secure the data, protect the data. You need to reveal, uh, disclose data. But then, data privacy is also about the user's control of sensitive data according to the minimality principle. What is the minimality principle? or minimal disclosure principle. Sensitive data should be controlled by the user during the whole life cycle and disclosed to the lowest possible extent for a minimum period of time only to entities and for purposes authorized by the user. Ideally, this principle should guide the balance between data disclosure and usability, but it is rarely applied in practice. For example, for targeted advertising, user profiling is very useful. You don't need to pro profile uh, to track a user over two years. One month, last month, is enough for targeting the advertising. If you do it for two years, then uh, it, it can be uh, uh, abused. Uh, so one reason for this, so we don't have this minimality principle in practice. On the contrary, one reason is massive user profiling by online service providers, since the user data has market value, so it can be sold also on the black market. 
The uh, another reason is the role of governments is the surveillance and law uh, is uh, the surveillance and lawful interception by government agencies and law enforcement authorities to help detect and monitor social threats and detect, track, and investigate criminal or terrorist activities. So this is positive, but on the other hand, the governments are not really, I would say, encouraging privacy techniques because uh, then you cannot do this thing uh, easily. So you have to do a surveillance in a focused way, not massive way, and then uh, we all know that uh, in many cases it's not done like that. So I would like to, 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 to put an alert here uh, related to privacy at present times. Massive user profiling, which is done nowadays, becomes massive citizen profiling if identity attributes, so we have identity provisioning, are associated with user profiles, like mobile phones and whatever, then you, you can have a situation when uh, you can store uh, citizen profiles of millions or hundreds of millions of users. You can all imagine uh, the effect of that, the possible negative impact of that. Uh, then uh, to continue with the privacy, privacy or sensitive data like personal data, this Internet of Things data and industrial secrets with respect to system administrators appears to be the biggest risk of the cloud business. In view of the fact, so it's privacy, uh, of the fact that data protection laws are relative to the physical location of data. So this is contrary to the nature of cloud, the, the concept. In fact, the location is not important, you just send data wherever. But in fact, it turns out to be critical because the data protection laws relate to the physical location of, of data. So uh, uh, we are propo I'm proposing here the uh, so-called privacy paradigm shift that is a bit uh, the, the different from the current practice or maybe essentially different. Support data privacy, so it's related to trustworthiness. Support data privacy by practical advanced cryptographic techniques, including, there is just a list, I don't have time to argue about this, privacy, so they're all practical now. Privacy preserving data mining and profiling, secure multi-party computation, practical homomorphic encryption, not fully, but practical, there are instances that are, pr that are, that are practical, secret sharing, Threshold cryptography, anonymization, anonymity protocols, anonymous credentials, attribute-based encryption. So these, the, the, there are these new fancy techniques that are related to cloud uh, privacy in the cloud. Format and syntax preserving encryption, searchable encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, and software of, of, obfuscation. In addition to tra traditional techniques like traditional encryption. Then enforce the minimality principle. That is not done in practice. It can be also imposed by law in practice. Address accountability, because we need also for this uh, tracking uh, of criminal activities and whatever. Address accountability by techniques for revocable anonymity. That's doable. Like for anonymous credentials, electronic coins, electronic cash. That's, that's all doable in practice. And then we, we should keep in mind that protection of sensitive data requires privacy-aware security platforms and mechanism, mechanisms in both software and hardware. So uh, 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 I'm closing now. So for the business opportunities, there are big business opportunities and big uh, risks in, in this area. In Europe, the market share of European companies in industry solutions for data security and privacy is lagging behind their global IT market share. This is possibly due to fragmented national regulations and government control as cybersecurity and privacy are considered to be matters of national security and, and, and safety. European technology solutions in this area and this after Snowden era, say, potentially have a comparative advantage with respect to trustworthiness. And uh, in this era, uh, in fact, enterprise institutions and organizations hesitate to send their sensitive data to the cloud. There are many applications where, uh, where cloud computing is used, but for big enterprises uh, and other companies, I mean, this is uh, the, the real situation. This implies that the business opportunities for deploying innovative solutions, offering high insurance for data privacy are significant. So companies are willing to invest more money in security and privacy. Let's just finish with a few uh, uh, words about the action line for privacy, security, and trust. The mission is to support users and businesses in protecting their digital assets and transactions, promoting robust and safe products and services that realize data privacy and security. Market opportunities are great and unexploited. Uh, so there is this privacy. It's about no, not only about security, but also the user's control of sensitive data, the minimality principle. Uh, so there are circles uh, uh, that think that, in fact, you can achieve cyber security. It's very popular now, cyber security. Uh, so resistance to attacks in the cyberspace and so on, without privacy. 
So we believe that this is a misconception. You need to protect sensitive data if you want to achieve uh, 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 cybersecurity. So I don't have time to uh, argue more about that. The strategy of the action line is to address cybersecurity and privacy by using more secure, trust also to be proactive, uh, trustworthy and transparent innovative technologies, bridging the gaps between available techniques and practice to promote security and privacy by design paradigm and, uh, paradigm and to raise social awareness. So the focus, for example, just uh, for, uh, to mention in the next three years of the action line is the first priority is privacy aware federated ID management and stroke authentication. So this is reflected in our uh, projects called uh, one year projects called activities. Uh, then the second priority is data privacy in online and mobile application services and communications. And the third one is protections uh, against malicious software and intrusion detection prevention on computing devices, especially on mobile platforms. So we have projects related to this, and this is the last slide. Uh, we also support uh, startups uh, in the ICT labs. Uh, that it, uh, this initiative uh, from this year, it relates uh, to uh, 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 each of the eight action lines. For the action line uh, for privacy, security, tr uh, trust, the team is cyber security and privacy. The call is open now in September. Uh, what it is, uh, this uh, initiative, it's a business ideas contest to support early stage startups and young innovators and researchers. Uh, team uh, should, should apply for, for, for this, should submit proposals. Uh, there should be at least one uh, member from, from each team that is citizen of European Union or legal resident. And uh, the startups uh, need to be registered in European Union. Uh, we will select three winners. In terms of prizes, it's 40k, 25k, and 15k euros. And also, the winners will receive coaching and mentoring from our teams, office space up to six months, and integration in our pan European network. So, this is what we do in relation to startups. So, instead of uh, the formal, uh, say, conclusion, uh, let, let me a uh, little bit advertise the, the role of ICT Lab. So, if you, uh, if you think that the situation in terms of the security and privacy in the world of ICT should be improved. And uh, if you think, uh, sh share our opinion that the business opportunities are great in this area, please consider joining, uh, joining our network of partners. And then uh, together, we can try to make a difference, at least in Europe. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Any question? Yes. Yes, that, that, that's a good comment, but the point is that uh, if you don't have any certification, that's bad for the, for the trust. So you, and if you have only very, very, very uh, expensive certifications uh, that are not very practical, this is also bad for trustworthiness. So we need practical schemes also. This was the intention of that. Uh, but your comment is right. Sometimes you need to pay <laughs> initially, basically, uh, all uh, uh, high security products initially are expensive and, and this is how you build up trust and then later with widespread usage they become like for example crypto phones this is the, 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 the this should be the situation okay another question no i think cost of certification is one thing but it has to be uh, also mutually recognized from one country to another one, from Europe to US, etc., etc. Otherwise, it does not really make sense. And it has to be uh, properly advertised as well to the users. Uh, today, uh, if you take a banking card, for example, I have quite a long experience in this domain. Uh, who knows that the product, the cards, or in the future, the mobile, 
have been certified, very few people, okay? And who in the street, down in the street, really care about it? They, they really care about the service provided by the, uh, the product. Uh, rather than that, I think the, all the actresses who saw their, 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 their pictures on <laughs> publicly on the net, <laughs> they were <laughs> very happy to use Apple, <laughs> iPhones and uh, iCloud, and, uh, because it's, it's very uh, practical, okay? But they just discovered the wrong thing, after all. So there is also, uh, in maybe among your initiative, it's in included, um, let's say the user education is, is also fundamental in this uh, domain, okay? Not only the professional one, but I mean the, the citizens and the consumers. It's, it's quite important. And I think Europe has to uh, take some initiative in this direction to make the people aware because once it's, it, 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 it happens, it's too late. Only one time is enough, you know, in security. In security huh? Yeah, for huh? distrust. Yeah. Okay, and one, uh, once it happens, it's finished. Okay, you have to recover everything. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Walid. Are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so, Walid, uh, uh, I hope I'm not uh, pronouncing your name the wrong way, <laughs> but you will do it. Uh, Endgame is from. Uh, Accenture Security uh, and D Labs, Accenture Technology Labs in the US, and is uh, probably more dedicated to the um, protections of uh, data concerning the industrial use of internet, right, and the cloud. Yeah. Okay, which is important because this is where the future is going, I, I believe, and it's probably a different concept. Uh, did you have? Uh, Presentation? I could do. Ah, did you, you send it? I hopefully I did, yeah. Or I can. If you have, uh, because I don't see. I sent it to Richard. Ah, oh, to that Richard. Chip to cloud. Is that the one? No, no, no. It's TCG. Okay. If you want to start again on it. <laughs> 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 no, uh, you have a. a uh, I do have a laptop. Uh, you have a laptop here? Yeah, yeah. The Maybe we can have one speaker and then I can okay, fix the problem. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. No That's problem. Okay. Who is what? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about the, uh, this. So, so, sorry. Uh, we will have. Uh, Michael was born from IBM Research Lab in uh, Switzerland, Zurich, no? <coughs> okay. Uh, and he is at the head of uh, Cloud uh, Solution and Security Groups. I think uh, no need to talk about IBM. You're going to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's, it's really nice to be given the opportunity to give um, a perspective from somebody the other side of the fence, so not somebody who's so much using cloud but some, somebody who's developing technology and offering cloud services. And um, I think it's very important that uh, we have a very different perspective, and so it's, uh, it's actually somewhat um, different than some of the perspectives I've heard today. So um, I'm going to talk briefly in three, in three areas. So the, what I call the cloud imperative, which is really for the, for the business people here, and a little bit about some of the, the risks. Some have already been discussed today, so this is for the security and risk people. And then a little bit about hardware security modules and their role in mitigating some of this risk. So that's a slightly more technical piece. So um, one thing I have to mention, so, so from our perspective, um, cloud is not about where you do something. Cloud is about the technology you use to do something. People have always used data centers either in their own factories or they've hired data centers in their local towns or in another country since decades. So people have done things in different areas for a long, long, long time. It's not about where you do something. It's about how you do it. It's about the technologies you use. In, in, inside of IBM, we used to call it utility computing 
before it was called cloud computing. Um, virtualization is one of the basic um, elements of this. It, it really is a disruptive innovation. And it's not just about virtualizing servers. It's about virtualizing whole infrastructures. So we are seeing, not we are seeing, we are, we are developing systems where routers, networks, everything. So a whole infrastructure is being virtualized and then it's being run on a, on a, single, on, on, on a single server. That's not so cool in itself. Yeah, sure, it makes uh, certain data center management um, um, a lot simpler, et cetera, et cetera. The, the key really is what we call software defined environments. Once you have virtualized hardware, you can start automating it. You can start automating um, how it's provisioned, where it's provisioned, how it's connected together. And this is the same for uh, the, the computing elements the networking elements and, and the storage elements. All of these, all of these elements are un undergoing a massive change within, the, within industry. It's, it's very difficult from the outside to appreciate it because you only, end up, you only see the kind of the applications, but um, it's a massive change in industry. How storage, what storage is used, how it's configured, the, the days um, where you have very large boxes of very special things, uh, they're going away. Um, it's, it's really... Um, so I really want to get across, this is changing the way people are doing IT and will do IT. These two things, virtualization and software-defined environments. I'll give you an example. So this is um, some project we carried out. If you wanted to, if you had a new application, a new kind of solution, you required some database servers, some, some, some web servers you, and on some, some computers. In the old world, it used to be, okay, you had some architects, you designed the system, figured out how large it was, um, went out and um, ordered, installed the servers, the software, you got your network people to configure the network, uh, installed middleware, da 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 Today, you can really do that about you select a template and you to like that and hit a button. And, and the difference is, before it used to take weeks or months to actually make something available for use, whether internally or externally, th this is measured in minutes. Okay? So, so what that actually means is it's about innovation and time to market. So, so basically, the, the, the primary message of the first part of my presentation is is virtualization and software-defined environments is allowing unprecedented, and it's really unprecedented levels of IT automation, and it's drastically shortening innovation cycles. So this is a real problem. So you have all the these um, large enterprises that are a little bit hampered with legacy, that the old way of doing things, and now you're getting um, a lot of young startups. Startups are appearing everywhere with, with very large, very sophisticated computer systems. These are systems which they've knocked up in, in weeks and months, not in, in, in years that, that, that a traditional enterprise would use. And that's very difficult to compete against, which is why it's really important that uh, the larger enterprises look at this technology, understand its implications, and, and start to grasp it. So. As with anything new, there are, there are new risks. So um, if we look at security, so this is um, it's a nice thing about working for a very large organization is this, I have lots of people who are able to go out collecting data for me. So we have a part of the organization which looks at all of the risks and events and security breaches around the world for, for our many thousands of customers. And they produce these nice charts. So, the, so this is a kind of two and a half years worth of charts. The size of the bubble is the cost of the impact. The color represents the type of impact. Um, and as you can see, I mean, the security breaches incidents are increasing in frequency. And the, the slightly worrying thing are the gray ones because nobody really knows how they happened. So these are the um, uh, ones that, um, you know, so-called zero-day attacks and things like this. And so basically, we have to ask ourselves, what, why have things gone wrong? So, 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 so why is the, is the industry in the state that it is when it comes to securing um, uh, organizations? Um, 
So there's uh, m many, many reasons, basically. Um, if you go to the OWASP website, you'll see the top 10 list of um, vulnerabilities that they found in software, for example. Um, so I think generally we can say that you know systems are very complex. Uh, we have a big challenge with um, awareness and developer skill levels. Um, everybody knows the, the pressure when, when you have to develop a project and get something out there. It's all about getting something out there that works and then think about security afterwards. So there's a lot of um, organizational pressure why, why security really isn't um, handled in the way it is. Um, we also have to reflect that security technology is difficult to use. Um, and, and we have the challenge with, with legacy systems. So a lot of challenges. Does this get better with virtualization, with software-defined environments? Uh, not really. There are a few areas where there are we, we, we look at there are additional problems. Um, so this is a kind of representation. If you see the green, the, the virtual machine at the top, you have all the, all the traditional risks and threats that you have with any computer in a box. Um, but we have some more. So you have these new um, ways to manage virtual environments. Um, we heard a little bit that actually um, this technology is actually causing large changes in the way that data centers are run. So for example, you're having few, a lot fewer people. You don't need so many separate, separate uh, jobs to configure networks. You have fewer people. Uh, with far more important roles. So that you have this whole challenge around uh, insider attacks with these um, much higher value roles. Um, with the applications, now, now all these virtual machines, they're very mobile. That's the kind of the nice thing about virtual machines is that you can throw them up when you want them, when you don't want them, take them down, or you can move them over there, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this dy these dynamics, which we also need to understand um, how to handle the risks involved. Um, it's the, 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 the challenge, the thing that a lot of people worry about is this resource sharing. So if you have multiple virtual machines on, on a single computer, um, uh, is it really safe? What are the risks? Can, that, can, can, can the owner of virtual machine one somehow figure out what virtual machine two is doing? Et cetera and et cetera. Uh, one other area of challenges is uh, what we call snapshots. So this is one of the key areas that, that, that virtual machines are automated. You can create a snapshot of a virtual machine, and this snapshot includes all of the memory, for example, at that current state of um, operation. This is a really neat feature, because if you need to update um, a set of applications, you can take a snapshot, you can try out the update. If it doesn't work, you just bring up the old snapshot. So you, you can save these snapshots. They are um, standard formats, well-known, easily copied. So you, ha you have this concept now that you, you can copy what used to be a physical computer. It's now a file on a disk, so with all the information on. So if this, if this needs to be protected accordingly. And these can be restored at any time. Okay, so um, a lot of security risks around virtual machine images. We have a, a crypto challenge here that a lot of cryptographic protocols um, are based on ha ha the security of these cryptographic protocols is based on good random data and the fact that you should never be able to repeat the piece of random data. If you now take a snapshot of a virtual machine and there is some random data somewhere in the memory which is used for a cryptographic protocol, then you can reload and reuse that as often as you like. And that really actually breaks some of the fundamental uh, security properties of these protocols. Um, so just summarize really the additional risk area. There's some, some additional risks around virtual images and how you uh, manage and secure them. So, uh, uh, sharing resources is the standard area that people worry about, about these um, side channel attacks. Um, and these are the two areas I'm going to address because these are areas which can be addressed by what I call good encryption, good isolation, and good randomness. These are, these are subject or topics that we've heard already today. Um, it's, it's a fact that you cannot protect software with software. So at some point, you have to use hardware. Um, in this example, I'm, I'm looking at hardware security modules. It could also be um, TPMs, for example. Um, the reason we're looking at hardware security models is because these are what we want to use for certain cryptographic operations. 
So, I, I guess you all know what um, hardware security modules are. There are lots of different formats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, basically, secure devices for carrying out um, cryptographic operations or storing things securely inside. Um, the challenge is a little bit in the in, in in using HSMs is that the safest way to use an HSM is to generate a secret or a key on an HSM and use it in the HSM so that it never leaves that nice secure world that, that it was born in. However, that doesn't really work in, in real systems because you need resilience. You can't have a secret which y an entire process or an entire PKI hierarchy or whatever is, is, is um, if, the, if the HSM dies, then that's your whole uh, security concept um, broken. So in reality, you need to be able to distribute keys. You need to be able to back keys up. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, the other, the, so now I'm going to address the problems about using HSMs. So HSMs are really designed to be used in static environments. That's their history. So um, in a single server, for example. And a lot of the protocols you use to actually talk to HSM are very stateful. So uh, I have an example here of a, of a PKCS11 application. Um, so basically, you have to open the session to a HSM, you have to log on. If you want to use a key, you first have to find it first. And basically, you start getting state stored in the application and state stored in the, um, in the, in the uh, hardware security module itself. The challenge is in a virtual world, we want to make everything very mobile and movable. So if we, um, if we have an application and it suddenly needs to move somewhere else or be replicated somewhere else, um, we can't move that state from one HSM to another HSM. So this means that what I want to get across is the, the standards that are currently used for using HSMs are not suitable for virtualized or cloud environments. Um, this is a kind of an architectural view of, 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 a, of a typical um, software stack to use a HSM. As you see under the red line, that's the mobility line. Above that line, you have applications that want to move around. Underneath, you have basically the driver and HSM, but all of the state. So the state, the sessions, the object, they're all under the mobility line. And actually, we need it this way around. You actually you need the state, the sessions, the object above the mobility line. These can be stored in a, in a database somewhere. They can be stored in the application somewhere. Um, but it's this, uh, and, and these, all of these things are, are, are protected using what we call key wrapping. And um, it's this approach, this new way of virtualizing keys and, and the state um, that would allow HSMs to be better used in, in cloud environments. And um, uh, this is something which is already uh, available. Uh, some, some, some research that we've done has actually flown into um, one of our, actually a mainframe environment. Mainframes also do cloud. And um, the, the trick is to kind of make it backwards compatible with, with PKCS11. So there's a, there's, a, there's a link there that you're, if, if you're interested in that. But um, um, I think I, uh, that's a kind of the end of my um, presentation. I'd like to address one thing. This, this thing about state, we've heard a about the trusted computer group. Um, let's say perspective on things. So what's really important for a cloud environment is this concept of a, of, a, of a grid, a utility grid. We used to call it utility computing, where an application can move not from a trusted server to trusted server, but from amongst a group of trusted servers. So this concept of um, enabling applications to be able to do that means that the protocols have to be um, developed accordingly such that they can handle this state problem. So, uh, I think that's, uh, okay, thank you. I think you make it uh, very quick. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay, that's okay. That gives us much more time for maybe some question in uh, some discussion. Yes, there are. Okay, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, there are several problems. One is to do with the attributes. So, so basically, there are a lot of different vendors. Um, 
and they, they all have proprietary mechanisms with which, under the covers, they um, specify attributes for a key. So you can, if you create a key on an HSM, you can then, via the PKCS11 interface, say, um, it should only be used for signing, it, is, it should never leave the HSM, or, or, and these attributes, um, you can define them via the PKCS11 interface for inside the HSM, but if you need to extract that key either to back it up or to, and, and you can extract a key out of a HSM, PKCS11 does not define how those attributes stick to the key. So it's very easy to extract a key from a HSM and it's just a, a random string and it can be then um, imported into another HSM with a completely different set of attributes. So one challenge is this um, bonding of attributes to keys. It's not standardized in how you move keys around. Um, the other thing is, as I said, from a HSM perspective, it's very, it's one thing if you um, create a key on a HSM and then only use it on a HSM, um, because from a security perspective, you can just prevent it being ex ex exported. But then now imagine that key is your root key for a PKI hierarchy and the HSM dies. Okay, so you have basically all of the, um, you, ha you basically have to recreate a completely new hierarchy with a new key. So, which is a very expensive and very complicated thing to do. So at the end of the day, you have two choices. You either escrow the key, you take it out somewhere and store it safely, um, or you use a proprietary key distribution mechanisms that HSM vendors have. And basically, um, if you look, uh, and there's lots of literature about the weaknesses of uh, and, and attacks on certain HSMs, it's always these interfaces which have caused the problems. The problems around the authorization with which keys are extracted from HSMs. So, um, to be honest, these days, if I look at high assurance systems, key management is handled completely differently. So the actual keys are uh, are secured outside of the HSM. They're always what we call blackened, um, meaning they're always protected. Um, and then you have very special mechanisms for what we call wrapping keys to be distributed amongst HSMs. But and let's say the old, the old methodology generating on HSMs and then having to distribute because you have to distribute. That's, that, that, that's what I was basically alluding to. I hope that, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I took a bit longer on that question so, uh, you, to make up for the shortness of the presentation. The next speaker asked me. Oh, is this a bit? Sorry. Another question? No? Yes. Maybe I didn't ask it, but what is the relationship between the Okay, so it's just that the functionality at the end of the day, I mean, the TPM you can use for storing keys and it has certain functions for, um, for uh, assuring signatures and, and things like this. Basically, a hardware security module is really designed for executing, crypt, um, let's say, more building block cryptographic functionality. So for all sorts of different um, cryptograph graphic schemes, you know, symmetric, uh, asymmetric cryptography, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, a, it's more of a, a secure execution environment rather than um, something very specific for the, for the job of um, assurance. I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, um, HSMs normally also allow uh, what the TPM by purpose is not designed for is um, bulk encryption. Um, we didn't do that because of export laws. So the, the uh, HSMs normally, which um, are used, have the possibility to do bulk encryption, are based on symmetric keys, which are then wrapped with um, um, uh, asymmetric keys. And this possibility the data stream is very minimalistic on the TPM for that purpose of um, worldwide adoption and that we can um, do the 
uh, can cover the export laws, basically. Yeah. That is an excellent question. Um, but basically, the paradigm for commercial cloud computing is that you can go online, you can order 20 servers, and you'll have them uh, a few minutes later. Um, actually establishing a very secure, um, or, or using a HSM in that kind of scenario is a bit more challenging, because it means you'd have to do everything remotely. Now, the, the, I guess there are different approaches, depending on who you trust. Um, if you trust the cloud provider to look after your keys, it's fairly straightforward. If you want to look after the keys or, or have control of those keys yourself, then you have to establish uh, a trust route uh, first. So this is um, usually achieved via a, an exchange as part of signing up to, a, to, a, to an organization to, uh, such as our, uh, our organization. So it's, uh, it's 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 a very good question because it's it's really um, it's it's really at the end of the day about who you trust and, and if I'm honest, um, a lot of people they they kind of want additional security through HSMs but they're always it's a, they're very difficult to use if 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 you don't know how to use them they're actually very simple to use I think but that's because I know how to use them but for a lot of people they're oh what are they how do you use them and, and and a large part for me about security is making things easy to use so a lot of Customs, I'm sure, would be very happy with a checkbox. Please use a HSM and, 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 and secure my applications using a HSM. And that is, um, um, yeah, so, but that requires a certain amount of trust on your, your, cloud, your cloud provider. Which service now? The yes. Well, <laughs> um, I have to be a bit careful because I'm in the research, so I see things which um, I, I don't often uh, know how long they'll percolate out into the into the larger world. But certainly, there is a lot of effort in this space. To um, th there are other. Um, I mean, we're, we're actually we're playing catch up with people who have that um, that type of functionality already. Where we're focusing on is is actually the. Um, we're a firm believer that the future for, for enterprises, that's the, the area that we're most interested in, there will be hybrid clouds. So and it's about the technology. So people will want to use the same technology, but certain data they will want on premise and certain data and things they will want somebody uh, to, to outsource that. So, um, so that's the kind of um, um, area that we're looking to cover with, with, uh, with, with the approach that we're taking. That differentiate it's a little bit different than let's say some of the some of them some of the other um, vendors in this space are using. Should I have taken? Okay. Uh, Kavina keeps disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's tried to find the next speaker. Do we have any volunteers from the audience for the next keynote? <laughs> So, 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 so maybe can I ask a quick question? So, how many of you are actually looking at sort of what I call cloud technologies within within your organisations? That's that's interesting, but because I think well, for me, like I said, the cloud imperative. This this is game changing technology, and. Um, I think it's something everybody should be looking very closely at. Okay, so no. So yeah, yeah. 
That's also a good question because basically this, this chart really um, depicts the, the different sorts of virtualization technology, what we call level one or level two, basically. Um, this is a kind of a level one picture where you have a, a hypervisor directly on top of the, the hardware and everything above that hypervisor is, is virtualized and needs to be able to move and need certain uh, characteristics, such as this statelessness, uh, or you have to manage state, but statelessness is good, to be able to, um, to be able to be replicated, to be moved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I call the mobility line. Now, there are other sorts of virtualization technology called containerization. So um, our organization has, a, has what we call its platform as a service. So it's th that line is a little bit higher up, and it's it's kind of uh, up in the middleware somewhere, and it's called containerization, and there the mobility line is higher up. So you, so you don't have an operating system in each virtual image; you have a kind of a just a simple packaging in each virtual image. So it's the it, for me it's the line at which it has to be. You expect things to move around exactly. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be the same host. No, in in um, this is one picture of one host. So imagine many, many, many of these hosts, and you have kind of that's like a a, a, a mesh, like a, a grid, and um, these things. Um, so, for example, if you have a problem in one data center, then you actually like this stuff to be run up in another data center, or. If you have a lot of demand in one geography all of a sudden because of some news event, you actually want lots more things to be um, instantiated in that geography. So it's all about the agility. And actually one thing I forgot to mention, all of this autom autom automation, security you can also automate. So this is, why I, this is why, I, why I think the big benefit of cloud technologies is the ability to automate some of the underlying security um, challenges that people have. So if, if, if you're just concentrating on the application, we can actually automate all the security in the OS and da, 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 at lower levels and make it easier for people to sort of an application to, to use that kind of secured um, um, infrastructure, so to speak. So that's my big hope for cloud, that to automate security.